Hey, Darren, are we streaming? He's not listening. Hey, Greg, are we streaming? Uh, I asked him like four times. It's on. It's on. Yeah. <coughs> Actually, I did want to say hi to Marcia because I bet she's out there <laughs> listening. She originally was going to be here tonight, but she has cold, I'm afraid, so... You get the leftovers. That's me and Phyllis, the leftovers. Sometimes I'm battle-weary. I forget to use my shield. The arrows pierce my armor. And I stumble in the field. But you won't do much good if it's hanging by your side. 
keep the shield of faith before you if you want to stay alive. I'll think my life is over, but the Lord, he comes to me. He heals my wounded spirit, and he sets me on my feet. A shield won't do much good if it's hanging by your side. Keep the shield of faith before you if you want to stay alive. Sometimes you're battle weary, but the war's already won. Keep your head and hold your shield high. Till your days are like are done or something like that. Yeah, a shield won't do much good if it's hanging by your side. Keep the shield of faith before you if you want to stay alive. A shield won't do much good if it's hanging by your side. Keep the shield of faith before you if you want to stay alive. That would have been perfect if Marcia had been here. <laughs> Pretty good to me. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Greetings to you in the name of our holy triune God. My name is Pastor Hannah phillips Camp. I'm the associate pastor here, and it is my privilege, as always, to welcome you to our celebration of worship. Even you, Aurora, yeah. Yeah, you too. To welcome you to our celebration of worship, where Christ welcomes you as you are a beloved child of God. Before we begin today's service, we have several highlights to get through, so I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, before we do that, though, please check in using your devices or the red pads at the end of the pews. All right, our first highlight is uh, you are cordially invited to join Pastor Luis next weekend for the third of our town hall discussions on the major legislation before the general conference in April. These talks are in compliance with the recommendations of our visioning team, and those recommendations were affirmed by the church council in November of last year. So this town hall is going to review multiple legislative proposals to alter existing church policies on human sexuality that are before the general conference. So the intent of this town hall is not to present personal feelings of Pastor Luis or of myself, but to provide the congregation unbiased and factual information um, that will help us understand the factors that could restructure the denomination as a result of differences on these and other issues. So that session will meet immediately following worship next Saturday and next Sunday. So you are invited to stick around. And the Sunday Town Hall will also be available via live stream if you cannot make it. Uh, on a similar note, the Pride Committee is going to be conducting a simple one-question temperature check survey next weekend in order to gauge where folks currently stand on the conversation around human sexuality leading up to general conference. That was also a vision team recommendation that was affirmed by the church council. So watch your inbox for a link to the survey next weekend, or you can take it before or after one of the town halls. And the hospitality team is looking for folks who want to serve our Sycamore UMC community as greeters by welcoming people to worship on Sunday mornings. This is a low commitment way to participate in the life of our church by welcoming others as Jesus welcomes us. We are hosting a brief information session tomorrow, the 17th after worship in the sanctuary right here, and we would love to see you there. If you are interested but you can't make it, you can let me, Beth Rommel, or Debbie know. Women in their 20s, 30s, or 40s are invited to take part in a day of spiritual self-care. Join Becca Rome and myself on this special retreat to the Perch in Aurora on Saturday, March 23rd. Clinician Amy Jackson will guide participants as we sit with who we are, identify the divine within, and develop practices to nurture our relationship with God and ourselves. And you can register by texting WOMEN2024, all caps, no space, to the church, or you can come to me with questions. It says see Becca with questions here, but Becca is in El Salvador, so don't try to talk to her. Talk to me. It is not too late to register for the high school service trip to Detroit this year. Physical forms and info packets are available by the youth bulletin board in the concourse. Forms can be turned into the office or to me. And digital registration can be completed by scanning the QR code. The total cost per student is $800 with opportunities to fundraise up to half of that, meaning the fee with all fundraisers is $400. And a $50 deposit is due on registration. 
Church scholarship applications are due March 31st. If you know a young person who is heading off to college or trade school this year, applications can be found on the church website. Our Holy Week and Easter schedule is available in your bulletin, in your newsletter, and on the website. And mark your calendars for our spring cantata presented by the Chancel Choir on April 6th and 7th at 5 p.m. And finally, we're at the end. Easter candy is needed to make Easter a little sweeter for our kiddos, so you can drop prepackaged nut-free candy in the bin by the Welcome Center. And before we get into worship, I would like to invite Bridget Johnson up to tell us a little bit about the new Sunday night worship service that is going to be launching next month. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Bridget Johnson. And I come to you today as co-chair of the Young People and Family Ministries Committee. Um, last fall, the visioning team recommended that Saturday night worship service be moved to Sunday evening as the anchor for a Sunday night experience. The church council unanimously accepted the recommendation. Res representatives from the Worship, Discipleship, and Young People's and Family Ministries have been hard at work making this a reality. We are excited to announce our new contemporary worship service, Break Free. This new structure of service incorporates breakout discipleship sessions into worship. This service will feature opening worship time with music and then a transition into a variety of breakout groups. These groups will allow congregation to discuss presented topics in depth and help each other grow in faith and community. After the breakout groups, we will gather together again in the sanctuary to close worship together. This service will be happening every Sunday from 4.30 to 6 p.m. starting April 14th. We are excited to see you there and help grow in faith together in faith. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. That was great. So then that means that our last Saturday evening service will be the Easter Vigil on the 30th because the cantata is the following week, so the cantata will be at 5 o'clock. And we encourage you to come out for that. It should be really great. And with all of that on our hearts, let's take a deep breath. And let me center you for worship with these words. As the world is made new each spring, God is always inviting us to be made new. Let's worship together. Please rise in mind, body, or spirit. And join us in the opening praise song, Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. It's great to see everybody here. If you stand or sit, sing loud. Join us. Help <laughs> us. <laughs> Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. And let's pray. Inscribe on our hearts, God, the love you have for us, the life you give us, the constancy of your presence with us. Inscribe on our hearts, God, the call to follow you, the longing to know you, the compassion to love as you do. Inscribe on our hearts, God, the story of salvation, 
the part we play in your purpose, the vision of your dream for creation. Inscribe on our hearts, God, all that you hold in yours, or at least as much of it as we can carry. Amen. And let's sing, Change My Heart, O God. Well, if you didn't sing real loud last time, you get another chance. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I my heart, oh God, make it ever true, change my heart, oh God, may I be like you, you are the power. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. In, oh, you may be seated, sorry. <laughs> in today's Hebrew scripture reading, God promises a new covenant in which God's law is written on people's hearts and in which no one needs to instruct another because all people will know God, will be forgiven by God, and will automatically follow God's ways. Children of God, listen to these words from the prophet Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 1 to 34 from the Common English Bible. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant with me even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. No, this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my instructions within them and engrave them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. They will no longer need to teach each other to say, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sins. In today's Gospel reading, Jesus teaches that a grain of wheat must fall to the ground and die in order to produce fruit and that those who try to save their lives will lose them, but those who give up their lives will guard them for eternal life. Then he asks whether he should pray to be delivered from his hour of suffering, but recognizes that this is what he came for, and that when he is lifted up, he will draw all the people to himself. Children of God, listen to these words recorded 
according to the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 20 through 33, from the Common English Bible. Some Greeks were among those who had come up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and made a request. Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Jesus replied, The time has come for the human one to be glorified. I assure you that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it can only be a single seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their lives will lose them, and those who hate their lives in this world will keep them forever. Whoever serves me must follow me. Wherever I am, where my there my servant will also be. My Father will honor whoever serves me. Now I am deeply troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this time? No, for this is the reason I have come to this time. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard and said, It's thunder. Others said, an angel spoke to him. And Jesus replied, this voice wasn't for my benefit, but for yours. Now is the time for judgment of this world. Now this world's ruler will be thrown out. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. He said this to show how he was going to die. May God bless the reading and hearing of tonight's scripture lesson. It was late one night last May, and the giant moving truck parked on Maple Avenue in Evanston was packed to the gills with all of Chad and Miranda's worldly possessions, which we had spent the last day and a half or so helping them load. The seminary-owned apartment that had been their home, and by extension my home, for the last two years was empty and about as clean as it was going to get. We were filthy and exhausted and drenched in sweat, and it was almost midnight by the time I finally sank down to the floor of the room that had been their office and leaned my head back against the wall. There was nothing left to do, and the rest of our friends had already gone back to their apartments to shower, but I wasn't ready to leave yet because I knew when I did, it would be goodbye. I had to be up early for work, and I wouldn't be able to see them off in the morning. The screen door slammed, it had always slammed, no one had ever bothered to add a closer, and Chad and Miranda tramped back into the apartment, returned from their last run out to the truck for the night. Miranda slid down the wall next to me with a sigh. I put my head on her shoulder, and she rested her head on top of mine. Chad, her husband, leaned against the wall across from us, looking utterly exhausted. We talked for a little about their long drive the next day, about how we couldn't believe that after all these years, this moment had finally come before lapsing into a silence that, while comfortable in the way silence among friends who've been through a lot together is comfortable, was also achingly sad. Chad and Miranda weren't the only ones leaving. Graduation from seminary meant that our close-knit group, after only two years of getting to be together in person, since we started school during early COVID, we were mostly going our separate ways. We were all from out of state, part of why we gravitated to each other to begin with, and a bunch of us were going back. Our friend Grace had been the first to depart the week before, and it had been incredibly hard. I had been mentally and emotionally trying to prepare for this rupture, basically since I had met this pe these people. It was always gonna be temporary, right? We were always going to move on. But some part of me was still afraid that I just wasn't gonna survive it. So I lingered in Chad and Miranda's apartment, listening to the two of them hash out their plans. I was content to just be there in this place that held so many memories with these people who had loved me so well and kept me going through so much through seminary. I wasn't ready to leave them, but eventually I had to. 
As soon as I started to get up, Miranda burst into tears. So I sat back down and we held each other and cried like our hearts would break for a long time. And I don't know how I managed to leave, but eventually I did. I walked the familiar path down the back stairs by myself for the last time in kind of a daze, for once remembering not to let the screen door slam behind me. I still remember brushing my fingertips along the rough brick as I walked, like I could carve the memory of this place into my skin. One important thing to know about me is that I hate change. <laughs> and I don't mean like the normal amount, like how no one really likes change, right? I mean, I hate it. <laughs> like, and I have my whole life. When I was about six, I think, I found a home video of a Christmas morning from when my brother and I were like two or three, we're twins. And I made it about 10 minutes in before I started sobbing incons inconsolably. And my parents came in, they're like, what's wrong, what's going on? And I didn't exactly have the words for it at the time, but I was able to kind of communicate. Even at that age, I could not stand how much I had grown up, <laughs> how much had changed, and how completely powerless I was to stop it. I could not handle it. On the last day of eighth grade, I cried basically all through lunch and pretty much to the final bell. Like, most people are probably pretty relieved when middle school ends. Uh, not me. I was just sad and scared of how everything was going to change. I could give you a lot of examples, big and small, from over the years. But suffice it to say, I have never been somebody who embraced change with open arms, even change I was excited about, right? From grade school to grad school, I am someone who has generally preferred the status quo. Unfortunately, I am also a Christian. And the Christian life, as a rule, isn't just full of change. A lot of the time, it demands it. So in today's Gospel reading, there's a lot happening. Jesus is in Jerusalem with his disciples for the Passover. We're getting close to Easter. And there were a couple of Greeks, possibly Greek-speaking Jews, in town for the festival, but also possibly just regular old non-Jewish Greeks. The text doesn't actually specify. Um, these two guys, they come to Philip asking to see Jesus. And what is interesting about this is Jesus' response. Throughout the Gospel of John up to this point, Jesus says several times that his time has not yet come. But now, these Greek people, whoever they are, are asking to see him. And what is Jesus' response? My time has come. The time has come for the human one to be glorified. This is not a coincidence. These new people showing up asking to see Jesus is a harbinger of the dramatic, earth-shifting change to come. The message is spreading, the circle is widening, the world is changing. This is the time. This is the time. So we've been doing this series for Lent from Sanctified Art called Again and Again. It's back there if you forget. Talking about all the different ways that God shows up again and again in our lives and in the world. And this week's theme is Again and Again We Are Reformed. What does it mean to be reformed? It means to change, right? To try something new. And reform is kind of a buzzword in Christianity, particularly Protestant Christianity. I mean, none of us would be sitting here if it weren't for the Protestant Reformation, right? We would be sitting in a Catholic church, it would be Mass right now, and I would maybe be speaking Latin. I don't know. Um, and since that great Reformation, not to mention leading up to it, the church has undergone lots and lots more instances of reform. As an institution, as individual congregations, it's just in our DNA. The Methodist Church split off from the Church of England, or the Anglican tradition, which, fun fact, John Wesley never actually intended for the Methodist movement to be a new denomination. He started it as a reform movement within the Anglican Church, where he was a clergy person and remained such until he died. And the Methodist Church was a Methodist Church, and it was something else. It was separate from Anglicanism, uh, which made him very sad. And it's undergone lots of reforms, both big and small, since then. And by all accounts, it looks like we are sitting right on the cusp of some more big ones. 
And if you'd like to learn more about some of them, you can come to the town hall next week. But it's not just Methodism that's experiencing a time of major, major change. The entire church is currently standing at a crossroads. Pastor Luis has had the staff doing what I am calling book club this year. And one of the books we're reading is called The Great Emergence, How Christianity is Changing and Why by Phyllis Tickle, which is maybe the best name ever. And her major argument in this book is that since the beginning of Christianity 2,000 years ago, every 500 years, there has been a period of massive transition in the church. Not just the Great Reformation, but the Great Schism and the time of St. Gregory the Great too. And if you're doing the math, you know that this means that the next time that happens is right now. And all you have to do is look around to see that that is the case. The church is standing on the cusp of what Todd Bolsinger, who wrote the other book that we're reading in book club, calls uncharted territory. He argues that the way that we've done things for the last century or even the last decade are not going to carry us through into this new world. It's not just that reform is happening every 500 years because that's magically how things work. It's that there are periods in human history, about every 500 years apparently, where the world has undergone such dramatic change that the church simply has to respond. And interestingly, Tickle includes the birth of Christianity as one of those major transformational periods, which it absolutely was. She calls it the Great Transformation, which she classifies as the time when God walked among us as Jesus Christ, making something new. And that transformation, that's exactly what Jesus is explaining in our passage today. So then the question for us is, what can this great transformation that changed the whole world forever teach us about this pivotal moment for the church, the big worldwide church and this little church right here, right now? Quite a bit, actually. So Jesus explains, I assure you that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it can only be a single seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their lives will lose them, and those who hate their lives in this world will keep them forever. I love this image of a seed falling to the earth to become something greater. I mean, it, it definitely speaks to our community, right? Out here in the cornfields. But I also love it because to me it speaks of letting go something I have historically been really terrible at. But I mean, think about it, right? Where is the seed falling from, dying from? If the grain were alive before, it must have still been on its stalk, hanging out, very comfortable. It has to let go if it's going to fall to the earth, to die, to bring forth new life. It has to leave behind the life it knew. And that's what Jesus means by hating their lives in this world. I don't know if you've noticed, but he likes to speak in hyperbole. He really enjoys setting things up in extremes. Jesus doesn't want us to literally hate our lives or the world or what makes all of those things worth loving. He wants us instead to not get so overly attached to the way things are, which is what he means by loving your life, that we miss out on how things could be on the abundant, transformed life he offers us. If we cling too tightly to the old ways, he's saying, we simply won't make it. Not to where he's inviting us to go, because you can't go anywhere if you're standing still. Here's the reason that I struggle so much with change, and the reason I think most of us probably do. Change always comes with loss. Always, by definition, you are always leaving something behind, even if it's just the way things were. And loss is hard. Switching to a new Sunday night service means leaving behind the Saturday night, this familiar, comforting routine. 
my friends Chad and Miranda going to live out their call as pastors in Arkansas, yes, they are both pastors, meant they had to leave behind a community that loved them, including me, and I miss them and my seminary friends every day. Planting a grain of wheat in the ground means it can't be sold or used for food instead. Saying yes to Jesus means letting go of how you moved through the world before. But the hope anytime something changes is that that loss will somehow be worth it. And what Jesus is saying and what God says is that in the big picture, somehow, with God's help, if we're willing to take the risk, it will. I have glorified my name and I will glorify it again, says the voice from heaven. Your sacrifice will be worth it. And Jesus tells the crowd, this voice wasn't for my benefit, but for yours. It's for our benefit. Jesus already knows. Friends, the simple truth is that we serve a God of resurrection, not resuscitation. In order for new life to be brought forth, and the church and the world need new life now more than ever, something has to die. John Vandelar over at Sac Sacred Eyes puts it this way. No relationship can be sustained without fairly regular dying experiences, he says. The single person must die to become united in a relationship or marriage. The couple must die to give birth to a family. The family must die to release the children to their own journey into love and growth. The same is true for community. The small group must die to become a community. The community must die to become an organization. Every season, he says, of growth, creativity, change, or reorientation requires a losing of life in order to save life. In ministry, this call to die is perhaps most keenly felt. The church cannot hold on to its own life if it is to be Christ's instrument of healing and justice in the world. Rather, the church must die to its own needs, to its own agenda, and to its own self-preservation, giving itself for the sake of those around it, or it loses its life and becomes an irrelevant social club. But, he says, if we embrace our deaths following Christ to the cross, we discover true, abundant life as we serve others. Here's the thing, friends. If the church truly wants to be the body of Christ, we have to think about what Christ did with his body. He didn't cling to his life. He gave it, and he gave it willingly. Whoever serves me must follow me, he says. Wherever I am, there my servant will also be. To serve him is to be willing to let go of the way things are in service of the way things will be. To risk loss, to stop clinging to our comfortable stock of grain and let ourselves fall to the earth, trusting that new life will somehow come of it. And it will, if we are willing to let it, because that is who God is, the bringer of new life, of a new covenant, of a new world. So I know you're probably wondering, what about those Greek people? What happens to them? Did they get to see Jesus? They are not mentioned in the rest of the passage. And that's because Jesus knows that they won't have to wait long. When I am lifted up from the earth, meaning crucified, he says, I will draw everyone to me. What he is telling the disciples here isn't just that when he's crucified, the Greeks and everybody else will see him up there on the cross. He's saying that in his sacrifice, they and us along with them will at last really see him for who he is, too. May it be so. Amen. Oh.
amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me i once was lost but now i'm found was blind but now i see so clearly hallelujah grace like rain falls down on me hallelujah all my stains are washed away they're washed away Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Hallelujah, grace like rain falls down on me. Hallelujah, all my stains are washed away, they're washed away. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, with no less days to sing your praise than when we first begun. Hallelujah, grace like rain falls down on me. Hallelujah, all my stains are washed away. Hallelujah, grace like rain falls down on me. Hallelujah, all my stains are washed away. Washed away. Amen. At this time, I invite us to enter into a time of prayer together. Pray for ourselves, our church, our community, our world. There are prayer cards in the backs of the pews in front of you. If you have a prayer request that you would like to share with the staff or even just pastors, if you have something you want to get on the prayer list that goes out um, or out on the prayer chain, or even if you just have something that you want to know somebody else is praying for, you can fill out that slip and you can leave it in the offering plate at the back and we will go over them and we will pray for you. We also have a prayer wall in the concourse, which you are welcome to add to as many times as you would like. It will be up for the rest of Lent. So at this time, I invite you to join me in an attitude of prayer, whatever that looks like for you. Let's pray together. Gracious, loving God. The world is changing. Your church is changing. We are changing. And we don't always like it. Help us to bear witness to your transformative power in the world, in our communities, in ourselves. Empower us to leave the old world behind, that we might encounter the world you are building in our midst. Help us to distinguish between change which gives life and change which harms the marginalized and the oppressed. 
God, we know that not all change is for the better. But we also know that you are working all the time. That there is no death that you cannot bring life out of. Help us to remember. Help us to care for one another. Help us to lift others up, to use our voices for good. Help us to be the community that you call us, that you know we can be. We lift up all those on the prayer list, all of those who are sick, who are grieving, who are recovering from surgery, who are suffering. We know that you are with them. Comfort them. Let them know your peace. We lift up those around the world who are in terrible situations, who are wondering where you are. Or if life can ever flourish where they are again. Show them that you are still with them. Help us to be part of that. Help us to seek out the transformation of your good creation as we seek to follow your son who gave up his life that we might find ours and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand if you can or want to and uh, sing our last song with us where he leads me, I will follow. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take that cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him. I'll go with him through the garden. I'll go with him, with him all the way. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. I'll go with him, with him all the way. Thank you 
so much, guys. That was awesome. Thank you to our tech folks in the back. Thank you to you so much for being here this evening. It was wonderful to worship with you. Please remain standing if it's comfortable for you to do so and receive this benediction. Beloved, the world is always changing. We are always changing. But take heart. God never changes. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Go forth to be transformed again and again in God's love and grace, trusting that God is with you in whatever comes next. Amen. Thanks be to God. Go in peace. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. No none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Oh, no turning back. Okie dokie. All done.